Paper Mario The Thousand Year Doors remake is real. It's really real. One of my all-time favorite games is back, and it's better than ever. I can't believe I'm saying those words. Picking this game up on Thursday morning just felt so incredibly right. I'm just no longer confined to just playing it on my CRT TV. This version of the Thousand Year Door is perfectly modernized without losing what made Paper Mario the Thousand Year Door great to begin with. Updated HD assets, new detailed sprites that just enhance the overall experience, brand new animations for every character that you you interact with, with some even having some brand new sound bits which can be heard in their dialogue as well. There are honestly so many notable additions. A new art and sound gallery, new NPCs of the Battlemaster and EFMS, some brand new boss battles, a partner ring for easy swapping, an updated soundtrack with the option to still go back to the original, a brand new pipe room for fast travel which was so needed in the original, a heap more save blocks, and hey, we now got confirmation that Vivian is in fact transgender. These changes alongside so many others just made this entire experience feel brand new again. I can genuinely bang on about this game for hours, but instead, let's make this a fun review discussion by ranking every Paper Mario chapter in the Thousand Year Door from worst to best. For the video sake, I will include the prologue as part of chapter 1, as it has no impact on my ranking. I have to also specify prior to starting. I love every single chapter in this game. Ranking them is just a fun little exercise, which I guess allows me to review them all properly. So let's not waste any time, and let's get straight on into the ranking. Entering the list at number 8, we have chapter 2, The Great Boggly Tree. Nestled within the mysterious Boggly Woods, this chapter presents players with a visual feast, as they traverse through a landscape adorned in striking shades of black and white. The ambience of the forest sets the stage for an adventure shrouded in mystery. We are guided by the cheerful puny, embarking on a journey through the depths of the woods, eventually arriving at the imposing great tree. Along the way, you encounter a bunch of puzzles and characters. My personal favourite is the Shadow Sirens, which we learn a lot more about during the game and even get the battle in this instance. Prior to entering the great tree, which essentially serves as a dungeon, we welcome our second party member to our squad being Madam Flurry. A gale force ability is extremely useful outside of battle, which lets her unleash a powerful gust of wind that reveals hidden secrets such as hidden passages and even sometimes items. From a personality standpoint, she is pretty good. She is one of my favourite party members due to others having some really interesting backstories, but I really do like her. The layout of the grey tree itself is pretty confusing. It's a really tall tree and there are little to no differences in each room, which can make it a little bit problematic and sometimes confusing. The main main annoyance is those punies, which Mario has to eventually guide throughout the tree to safety. God damn it. What I love about this chapter though is that this is the first real exposure to the x Nords, and the concept here is brilliant. They've taken over the great tree and it really showcases that they are a threat that is planning on taking over. However, the main issue with this chapter that has it standing at the bottom of our ranking is the main boss. Lord Crump is simply just in a mechanical vehicle here known as Magnus Von Grapple. It's not a bad boss by any means, but it is used a fair bit throughout the game. It also feels somewhat underwhelming following Chapter 1's boss fight where you're fighting a humongous dragon. I do, however, absolutely love the theme of this boss fight though. Overall, Chapter 2 is still extremely great. I love the new colour concept in the woods itself in this version, which has the floor glowing as you continue walking. I also love getting to spend a little bit of time with Princess Peach following the chapter's conclusion, where tech starts to learn the motion of love in the form of dancing with yourself, and if that doesn't win you over, it's sure Surely using Bowser rolling through Pedalberg as a side-scrolling Mario level will definitely will, especially when he sees that it's just Peach as a cardboard cutout in a window. It's just phenomenal. In the seventh spot, we have Chapter 7, Mario Shoots the Moon. This chapter is a wild ride of emotion to me, which has been drastically improved in the Switch version. If you've ever played the Thousand Year Door, you know exactly what I'm talking about. This is such a lopsided chapter that it's almost comical. You start at the beginning of the chapter, heading to Far Outpost, a beautiful icy village. The outpost consists of several buildings and houses, all of which look like bunkers and is home to many bob -ombs. As a kid, this location was one of my favourites, as it reminded me a lot of Paper Mario 64's Shiver City. Mario and his allies must get Gold Ball's permission to use the Big Bomb Cannon here to get blasted to the moon, which is definitely the highlight of this chapter. But of course, there's a snag. You have to go fetch Gold Bob and then General White, and that's where the trouble begins. Gold Bob isn't too difficult to find if you pay 
attention by General White. Oh boy, this guy must have the ability to teleport or something because tracking him down is an absolute nightmare. He's like trying to find the needle in a haystack, except the haystack is the entire game world. You have to track through every location imaginable. It's just a wild goose chase for no apparent reason. I personally don't mind the backtracking and I did it in the original as well, but I can definitely see how a lot of other people would find this a problem. Thankfully though, the remake has an enhanced pipe room that has warp pipes to every chapter. This makes it a whole lot easier this time around. Once this is all resolved though, you do get to the fun part. You're blasted to the moon where we get to storm the x North Fortress with the sole objective to rescue Princess Peach. The puzzle solving here is absolutely fantastic. I love how Mario is navigating various floors thanks to the base's elevator. The music in this location just sets the mood perfectly as well. The enemies also offer a diverse range of challenges and just exploring the rooms that Princess Peach previously traveled through just adds an extra layer of depth to this experience. It's a pretty similar feeling to exploring Peach's castle in Paper Mario 64 and I absolutely love this. My biggest gripe with this chapter though is definitely having to wait one more chapter to fight Brutus and fighting Crumb for what feels like the 10th time just feels like a pretty recycled experience. This chapter is still fantastic though. It's less action packed than the other chapters but it does actually require you to use your mind. There is also unfortunately no Peach interlude during this chapter for obvious reasons. However, I did get a good laugh out of the Bowser one though. Alright, combining forces at number 6, we have chapter 1 and the prologue. You might be surprised to see this chapter in this position. And no, it's not because I've included the prologue. I have to admit, my love for this chapter may be influenced by some serious nostalgia. Chapter 1 of the Thousand Year Door stands out as my favourite opener in the entire Mario RPG series. In my opinion, it flawlessly builds on from the prologue, just immersing you in the adventure right from the start. Let's start with the prologue. Brokeport is introduced through a letter from Princess Peach, and it immediately sets the stage with rough atmosphere and shady characters. Getting to meet Lord Crump and the x Norts at the very start just hint to the challenges that lie ahead. You get to then partner with Goombella, explore the sewers, and just learn about the Thousand Year Door and the Crystal Stars, which all seamlessly leads into the quest for the very first Crystal Star in Petal Meadows. The prologue ultimately packs the punch by introducing a very intriguing story, a very shady hub world, the interconnected sewer system, and it's even complete with a mini boss battle against a giant blooper. Chapter 1 of the Thousand Year Door is where the real action kicks in though, from Petal Meadows to Shrunk Fortress and finally Hooktown's Castle. It's a thrilling ride in what feels like a pretty medieval adventure. The journey starts in Petalburg, where the mayor informs you about Hooktown's reign of terror. The goal is pretty clear, defeat the dragon, restore peace, and claim that crystal star. After a detour through Shrunk's Fortress for a quiz game and a battle against the gold fuzzy, it's onto Hooktown's Castle, which essentially serves as the very first dungeon of the game. Before you head off to Hooktown's Castle, you actually team up with Koops, who is driven by his desire to avenge his missing father. I absolutely love Koops' personality, and watching him grow in confidence throughout the adventure is absolutely adorable. His ability in the overworld of being able to kick the Koopa shell to solve puzzles is also great. The castle itself is packed with so many traps and enemies, and I really love this castle. I love the fact that you can unlock an optional party here as well later on the game being Miss Mouse. Not sure which chapter to throw that in, but considering it's actually part of chapter 1 I guess, there's a bonus point for this chapter. The castle of course leads to an epic showdown of Hooktown at the very top. The boss fight here is pretty intense, mostly due to Hooktown's savage attacks in the crowd and even offering Mario to let him have a whiff of her feet. The difficulty of the boss fight isn't too bad though, especially if you apply the cricket badge which is her weakness. Ultimately, this chapter ends by defeating Hooktown, claiming the crystal star and saving Koops' dad. A few things I want to briefly mention before moving on though. This chapter is very similar to Paper Mario 64's chapter 1. However, I do really like how the plot is very different and I love the introduction of both the plain ability and the thin paper ability, which both have some nice puzzles alongside with it. There is also a little small detail I need to mention that I love from Hooktown's castle. If you've played the original Paper Mario 64, you'll run into a dead adventurer being Colorado's father. For those who don't know, Colorado was a Cooper adventurer from the original Paper Mario. It was just great story building, learning more about a previous friend and what happened to his father. Finally, I also love at the very end of this chapter, we get to learn more about Princess Peach and the X-Norts. We get to meet Tech, convince him to send an email to Mario, and uh, let's not mention that shower scene though. It was also pretty funny seeing Bowser get involved in the story and being two sets behind Mario. Overall, just an amazing start to the game. Gaining 
momentum at number 5, we have Chapter 5, The Key to Pirates. This chapter takes place on the remote island of Keyhole Key and inside the Pirates Grotto, which is a layer of caverns that leads to the treasure of the Ghost Pirate Cortez. Before the chapter even begins, we must find Admiral Bobbery within Rowport and convince him to sail the seas once again. This kicks off a really compelling subplot as we learn a whole lot about our new partner Bobbery's tragic past, and we get to watch him overcome his fears and sail the seas once more. On a really brief side note, I absolutely love his design. He has his old sailor hat still on, and even has a ship wheel as his ticker, and I also really love his ability outside of battle, just being able to explode and blow up cracks in the walls. This chapter features a band of interesting new supporting characters, namely Flavio, who brings a lot of comic relief to the table. In terms of gameplay, while it is occasionally frustrating to have to go back and forth through the island jungle so many times, it's still an equally testing experience, and one that allows you to uncover all sorts of new pathways and a whole lot of secrets. We get the keyhole key due to being attacked while sailing to the islands by embers. This results in us sinking and washing the entire crew to the shore. This is an issue in itself, as Keyhole Key is a southern island that is disconnected from all kinds of society of the outside world. I just absolutely love the setup of this chapter. It makes you feel completely hopeless. The boss battles in this chapter just add to the overall atmosphere. We of course have Cortez, who is a dread pirate ghost, who is feared by all. He resides on the Black Skull, which is a pirate shop located deep within the pirate grotto. The ship is stuck there because Flavio's ancestors stole the gem, which powers the ship. The ship is absolutely beautiful on the inside and is full of stolen treasure. I absolutely love this boss battle in itself. Cortez's design is absolutely amazing. He is literally a skeleton that is a dead pirate, which is absolutely massive and has like a hook as a hand. And it's just great. That's all I have to say. And the battle itself is pretty nice and it's split up into three rounds. It's arguably one of the better boss battles in the entire game. And the boss battle has a really funny conclusion as well. As soon as he realizes all you're after is the crystal star, he just literally hands it over to you. This then results to you being able to get back to Rogueport and then you get to fight Lord Crump who was actually hiding in the ship's crew all along. Back over on the Peach interlude, we get to sneak around uh, naked while being invisible to get a disc containing secret information in Grutus' room to send to Mario. Making that invisibility potion though as a kid having to wait 30 seconds with no phone in hand was really difficult though. On the Bowser side, he's still lacking behind only just reaching Twilight Town, but it was pretty funny watching the interaction between the two silliest characters in the entire game. Rising to the fourth spot, we have the final chapter of the game being chapter 8, The Thousand Year Door. I found this chapter extremely difficult to rank at spot number 4, because this is honestly my favourite finale chapter from the entire Paper Mario series. The fact is ranking it at number 4 is just credit to The Thousand Year Door's chapters as a whole. This game is seriously a masterpiece. Final chapters of games usually feel quite unfulfilling at times, and this is because there's a lot of expectations on them. In The Thousand Year Door's case, the entire game from the very opening cutscene has been to enter The Thousand Year Door, which has been around prior to the settlement of Rogueport. There's no difference for this game. The expectations here are seriously as high as any other game, and the best part is it doesn't disappoint in the slightest. It brings together all the story elements for an explosive finale. The palace is one quarter of the old city that was ruined a thousand years ago. It's a pretty unnerving stage. It gives a serious traditional gothic horror vibe with classic scary artifacts and very dimly lit corridors. The entire chapter is full of puzzles, traps, and in my opinion, the highlight being the enemies and boss battles. The palace is split into three phases, and there are numerous bosses that are present throughout. From the ferocious Gloomtail being Hooktail's older brother, to Bowser, the Shadow Sirens, and of course Grutus and the Shadow Queen. These battles are actually quite difficult, and the experience points that you've racked up in previous chapters certainly come into use. The conclusion to the story is also extremely rewarding. You get to rescue Peach, return back to the homeland, and even get to go back to explore the world that you saved and learn lots about what your partners are doing post the thousand year door. I also want to briefly mention the Pit of a Hundred Trials. This technically can be done whenever, but I see it as more of a post game experience. This in itself is extremely fun and pretty challenging. I especially love the battle against Bonetail and the newly added boss for the remake in Wacker. It's just super fitting because Wacker actually was intended to be in Paper Mario 64, but it was ultimately removed. This game overall is just such an enjoyable experience, and now I really hope we get a proper sequel to it one day. Oh boy, now it's time for our top three. Starting off in spot number three, we have chapter six, Three Days of Excess Express. Now, I've got a feeling this pick might stir the pot a little bit 
little bit. But hear me out. This chapter, along with Glitzfuls chapter 3, really shake things up in the right ways. Let me break it down for you. Chapters 1 and 2 have us exploring vast landscapes, clocking in some serious travel time. Then chapter 3 throws us into the ring at Glitzfield, where it's all about those intense battles in tight quarters. That was a real nice refreshing change that really sets the stage for the epicness of chapters 4 and 5, where it's back to exploring those vast worlds. But chapter 6 has us going back to that cozy feel, even though we're covering some serious ground aboard the XX Express. This chapter feels like it's straight out of a mystery novel, unfolding aboard the prestigious XS Express train bound for Poshley Heights. What starts with a routine three-day journey quickly spirals into a web of intrigue and suspense. There's theft, there are threats, and the tension on that train is super high. I mean, what did you expect out of a train that's literally leaving from Rogueport? Enter Pennington, a wannabe detective who helps solve these cases alongside Mario. Together, they not only bring a lot of humor, but manage to capture Duplass in disguise, who attempted to halt the train by causing an explosion, and they even solve other crimes as well. This chapter is both atmospheric and humorous, with beautiful music covering the day, dusk, and night periods on the train journey, as well as the calming Riverside Station. The mid-stop to the Riverside Station, though, does have an eerie atmosphere as Mario navigates within it to find a hidden switch. You encounter strange creatures in that process as well, that even end up being the chapter's boss battle, the small. The boss battle itself is an epic fight, and it's literally on the roof of the out-of-control train. I seriously love this boss battle. This all eventually takes us to the beautiful Poshley Heights, which is rich and luxurious. It's the complete opposite of Rogueport. Unfortunately though, the Shadow Sirens did get there before Mario and even stole the Crystal Star. But thankfully, that was only a replica and Pennington shows Mario where the real Garnet Star lies. I absolutely adore this chapter. I really love Paper Mario 64's Chapter 7, A Star Spirit on Ice, which was essentially a murder mystery and this chapter for me is just as good. Now, let's quickly talk Peach. Her segment certainly hits you right in the feels, as the x Nauts wipe text memory completely clean. Yeah, look, I know he's just a computer, but man, that was a real gut punch watching that back again. And then there's Bowser as well, who's always lacking a step behind Mario, and this time he's getting knocked around by Raw Claw. Just simply an overall phenomenal chapter. This takes us to our number 2 spot, and what will it be? Chapter 4 or Chapter 3? Truth be told, I actually had to consult with Albert Boris for this one, who provided me with the concrete answer. Albert simply said, Chapter 3 is kingly. And that was enough to sell me. So with that, spot number 2 goes to Chapter 4 for the Pigs the Bells Tolls. This time, Mario journeys to the dark and dismal Twilight Town, which is under a horrific curse that sees the locals being turned into pigs. Mario journeys to the haunted creepy steeple to uncover the culprit, of course. This turns out to be an obnoxious prankster named Dupless, a Dupli ghost who has the ability to copy the appearance and abilities of his foes. A clever plot twist soon awaits. Once Dupless is beaten, the chapter initially seems to be completed, but this isn't the case at all. Dupless then takes the form of Mario and makes off with his friends. This leaves Mario as a featureless shadow who must recover his identity before time runs out. This plot twist leads to Mario teaming up with former foe Vivian. I absolutely love Vivian as a character. I would go as far to say that Vivian is my personal favourite from the entire Paper Mario series. I also love Vivian's ability as well outside of battle. It allows Mario to essentially turn invisible. It's pretty similar to Lady Bo from Paper Mario 64. On an aesthetic scale, everything here is spot on. The haunting, dim visuals of Twilight Town and the jet black appearance of Creepy Steeple really combine together to create a very scary atmosphere and is only complemented by the amazing dark music. Dupless himself is a little bit too easy of a boss fight though, but as a character, he really makes for an entertaining, humorous villain. I also love how you actually find the identity of Dupless, which is by simply talking to his pet parrot, who even gives you some great one-liners as well. That aside though, this chapter is one of the most creative and certainly is one of the most enjoyable from beginning to end. It's pretty hilarious to see Mario's other partners take the Crystal Star and leave with who they think is the real Mario. The optional boss fight against the Atomic Boo is also really good fun as well. The remake version is also so much better this time around as well. It actually fixes up the backtracking issues that this had in the original. All they did was just simply add a pipe in Twilight Town that goes straight to Creepy Steeple, and it really helps a lot. The Princess Peach segment here is awesome as well. We get to complete an a quiz 
which actually provides information on what the treasure of the Thousand Year Door really is, which then of course gets provided to Mario. We also get to see Bowser fail to get to Glitzville thanks to his Koopa car malfunctioning, leading to Bowser having to return to Roquefort. This is all whilst Kami Koopa was enjoying the fight to Glitzville and eating hot dogs. It was actually really funny to watch that all unfold. This chapter is fantastic from start to finish. And this takes us to my number one spot, of course being Chapter 3 of Glitz and Glory. Chapter 3 has Mario flying up to the vibrant city of Glitzville, which is home to the renowned Glitz Pit. That's a fighting arena for the bravest and strongest of souls. You can kind of compare it to the UFC or maybe even the ancient Rome Colosseum. To get the Crystal Star here, Mario has to enlist into the fighting pit and has to win a lot of fights in the process to get to the champion. And the reason behind that is, is because the Crystal Star is on the champion's belt. As mentioned before with Chapter 6, this chapter shakes up the general explore the world, fight a boss kind of vibe that the other chapters have going for it. We are simply just fighting our way to the top here. And this chapter is amazing for character development. This chapter provides some of the most opportunities to rack up experience points and add tons of new foes to your title log. The higher up you go on the league table, the harder and more interesting the opponents become. And this all leads to a very satisfying conclusion with a superb boss battle against Raw Core. And then you become the champion of the ring. But that isn't all of course, as you then have to fight Grubber because the star on Raw Quark's belt was actually fake and Grubber has the real one. Both of the battles here are extremely entertaining and they're actually relatively challenging as well, which I absolutely love as the entire chapter is literally fighting. The highlight of this chapter for me though is definitely obtaining the chapter's partner being Yoshi Kid. This partner feels extremely special as you're literally hatching him from birth as you get the egg from Mr. Hoggle. I also love how the Yoshi's color will vary depending on how many minutes have passed before he hatches. He also allows allows Mario to name him, which is just amazing. Yoshi's ability is probably the most useful in this game as well. You can ride him to travel much faster and even use his flutter jump ability to cross gaps. Overall, the backstory behind this entire Glitz Pits mystery also leads to more gripping twists and some bittersweet subplots. There is a host of memorable characters, witty dialogue, and a tense atmosphere that benefit this chapter in a narrative sense. I especially love in the remake the newly added optional boss fight against the Glitz Pit first ever champion being Prince Mush. It's just amazing that we now had the opportunity to fight and beat both the champions that came before Mario. I'm just really happy we got this additional content. The Peach segment though does complement this entire chapter where we get to disguise as an x and walk around like one. The Bowser segment however was literally only talking to punies though. Nothing too exciting this time. And with that, this has been my rankings of Paper Mario the Thousand Year Door Remakes chapters. Be sure to let me know down in the comment section what your rankings look like. The experience of playing Paper Mario the Thousand Year Door again has only reconfirmed for me my love of the Paper Mario experience prior to Sticker Star releasing. I really hope with the positive feedback from critics and the general Nintendo audience that Nintendo really understands that this formula should be used more moving forward. Speaking of, if you did enjoy this video, be sure to check out my Paper Mario series ranking I released yesterday, which of course includes the new Thousand Year Door remake. You could even check out my Super Mario RPG chapters ranking or even my Super Mario Mario Bros. Wonder World Ranking. Links can be found in the description. It'd be much appreciated if you could leave a like and of course subscribe. It honestly helps out the channel a lot here. And hey, if you didn't agree with my rankings at all, tell me I'm an idiot in the comments. That also helps the algorithm as well. Until next time though, take care, go out and buy Paper Mario the Thousand Year Door and goodbye.